Good morning, family, and happy Father's Day. My name is David Swan, and I am the proud father of six beautiful, wonderful children. And so it's a great honor for me to be able to give a lesson today on Father's Day. And so please turn your Bibles over to Exodus chapter 34. I want to talk a little bit about the concept of the apple not falling far from the tree. Uh, some experts call this passage the generational curse. And so let's dive in and see uh, what they're talking about here. And so in Exodus chapter 34, in verse 6, it says, And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Some people misunderstand this, thinking that sin uh, from the parents is being judged by God to the children, and that's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is suffering. When our parents um, live a life of wickedness, rebellion, and sin, then the, the children feel it. They feel that stuff, and it stays with them. And so there is this form of punishment, and it is a law that God uh, put down and hopefully it motivates the parents to live a great life so that their children uh, don't suffer. I know for myself it uh, it became real uh, this last few weeks as I talked to my mom and she told me about the racism uh, that lived in my dad's family, how his dad was racist and he was an alcoholic, he got divorced, he was super abusive to the kids and uh, really just treated my dad horribly. Um, and then my dad, uh, he became a racist and an alcoholic and filled with rage and anger and, and uh, brutally beat my mom a couple times, put her in the hospital. He did that to myself. He was, uh, he was out of control when he drank. And then uh, also divorced. And so I uh, grew up in a divorced family and uh, he left when I was 10 or 11 years old. And then when I became a teen, I was filled with rage and anger. Got kicked out of three different high schools, uh, was uh, getting high all the time to escape all the pain in my life. And um, filled with rage, got married when I was uh, very young, 18 years old, had four awesome kids. But I didn't know how to be a father. I didn't know how to be a husband. I cheated on my wife uh, all the time. And uh, seven years later, she kicked me out when I was 25 and divorced me and took the kids, and rightfully so, because uh, I was a danger to her and the kids. I was unstable in everything that I did. But uh, God had mercy on me the following year. Um, he put someone in my life that introduced me uh, to the church. I came uh, to church for the first time, and it blew me away, all the different um, age, ages uh, from young to old, uh, black, white, all different uh, nationalities, and it really moved me. And uh, I started to study the Bible, and it changed my life. And uh, that's where I met my wife in the church, Jill. We ended up getting married. Actually, uh, in a few weeks, it's going to be our 25th uh, uh, anniversary uh, of being married, and it's uh, super exciting. Um, after we got married, I ended up having we ended up having our first child together, and uh, his name is uh, Jordan. We named him Jordan. And I know some of you are thinking it was after Michael Jordan because I'm a basketball fan, but it was not Michael Jordan. We named him after the Jordan River because this is uh, the river that people pass over to get into the promised land. And it literally means second chance. And for me, that's what I felt coming in to the church, getting a second chance in my life and being able to break the generational curse. Hi, I'm Jordan. Please turn your Bibles with me to 2 Samuel chapter 7. You know, I appreciate Father's Day a lot because uh, I do appreciate my dad. And it's crazy hearing his testimony because the person that he describes himself to have, be to have been before he was a disciple to the man that I know now, it's two different worlds. But when I think of Father's Day, although I do really appreciate my dad, I think about uh, our universal father, and that's our father in heaven, obviously God. And uh, in this passage, we're going to hear about God talking about his heart as a father to his children. And in 2 Samuel chapter 7, starting verse 14, the Bible reads, I will be his father, and he will be my son. 
When he does wrong, I will punish him with the rod wielded by men, floggings afflicted by human hands, but my love will never be taken away from him. And I love this scripture because we see God's heart as a father. He's like, yeah, I'm going to discipline you. When you do wrong, you're going to know you did wrong. You're going to get punished, but just know that it's always out of love. And his promise is that his love will never depart from us. And I love this because I think like growing up as a kid, anytime it was time for a, like a powwow, you know, when we were really young or spanking or time out or, or even like any kind of punishment, even as a teenager, it, it always felt like, man, like, why does this guy hate me? You know, like, why is he just on me right now? I don't get it. And as children, we often lose sight of the heart behind a father and the heart behind a father's discipline. And it's always out of love. Uh, I know growing up, I had my fair share of discipline always well-deserved <laughs> because I would do things that would get me in trouble. But what's amazing and what I really appreciate about having a father who's a Christian, who, who goes to our church, who's a part of the kingdom, is that even as a kid, I, I never really felt like the discipline lacked love. Because my dad would, would always express that to me. I remember when I was like seven or eight, maybe a little younger, I had like my toy lightsaber and I would just smack my friends with it. And you know, they would cry and I would get in trouble. and. <laughs> It was time for a spanking. But I remember, you know, I'd, I'd be crying and, you know, I'd be upset. I was a kid. And my dad would always hug me and t tell me he loves me. And he would explain why he's doing this so I can learn it, so that I can be better. And so when I hear about, you know, the, the abuse that my father went through and his father's father and another generation after that, as far as we know, um, I consider myself just incredibly fortunate. And I'm so lucky and privileged to, to be a part of a family and to really grow up in the kingdom of God, to grow up in the church. Um, I remember that the, 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 one of the moments where I look back on and I realize that my father really just always poured his heart out into me is uh, when I was younger, me and my dad used to watch movies together. And I remember when I was like six, seven years old, maybe eight, uh, we were watching Forrest Gump together. And in hindsight, it's a little young to be watching an R-rated movie. But uh, it's a different conversation. <laughs> but we were watching Forrest Gump together. And if you haven't seen the movie, uh, the movie follows Forrest and uh, his friend Jenny. And they grow up together in a rural countryside America. And so Forrest is raised by his single mother, who is always just pouring out her affection and nurturing her son. Whereas Jenny is raised by a single dad who is very abusive. And the movie depicts physical violence. It's suggestive of sexual violence. And you see how although they live in the same town, they're growing up in two completely different environments. And as the movie goes on, they kind of like go their different ways. And at one point, Forrest Gump enrolls in the military and he's in the barracks with all the other soldiers and they're like passing around like a Playboy magazine. And they're like talking about the girl on the cover. Like, oh, look at her. And they're really objectifying her and sexualizing the woman on the cover. And so they're passing the magazine around and then it gets to Forrest. And Forrest looks at the magazine and the camera shot goes right to the cover and it's Jenny. And I remember my dad paused the movie and he turned over toward me and he told me that when I got older, I would be put in situations like this and I would find myself in a similar circumstance where everyone around me is, is uh, just filled with lust and they're objectifying people and, and sexualizing people. And he told me to never forget about the lives of those who end up on the cover. He told me to never fall for the facade and to remember the reality. And I was pretty young when he told me that, but that just always stuck with me because he was right. You know, I played basketball in high school. I played basketball a little bit in college too. And locker room talk is a real thing. You know, being put in, in these environments where everyone is talking about people like they're not even people anymore. And then it comes to me, what about you? And I'm so grateful that at such a young age, I had those convictions instilled in me. Um, and so I always knew pornography was wrong. I always knew objectifying people was wrong. And, and I really, attribute that not to my own character at all, but to the upbringing I had that I was able to have because I grew up in the kingdom, in the church. And so I think a lot of times we experience things like that, whether it be from our parents or father figures, or if we didn't have that, like, I think God is always trying to teach us in our lives. And you know, what's crazy pretty much universally is when children are disciplined, when children are taught, we almost never say thank you. We almost never appreciate the, the love and kindness and really all that was poured out into us. And so something I want us to do on Father's Day is to take a moment and think about everything that's been poured out into you. I know for me, I can thank my father. 
If you can't thank your father, there could be someone else in your life. And if there's no one, well, then understand that God has been working in your life this entire time. I love Acts 17, verse 26 through 28, where it says that God determines the times and places that we should live so that we would perhaps seek him and reach out for him and find him. And I love that scripture because the Bible is literally saying that every situation we're in and every single conversation we have and, and where we are and when we're there, that is all determined by God so that we could have a free choice to reach out to him and seek him. And honestly, I wish I could sit here and say that I've been a great example of a son because that's far from the truth. Uh, I've been incredibly disrespectful to my parents and I've taken pretty much everything I've been given for granted my whole life. And, you know, coming in, you know, to, uh, to this year, really, I've been reflecting since I, you know, I moved out and I live in my own place now. And I've just been thinking about how much my father really poured out into me and how often he never heard thank you. He never heard I appreciate you. He never heard I love you too. And, you know, being that it's Father's Day, I think all of us have those regrets. I'm sure all of us have those moments we wish we could take back the, the things we said we wish we did and, and the thank yous we wish we gave. And I want to encourage you that it's not too late. Today's a great day to do it. To pour back into those who poured into you and to really honor God by glorifying our fathers on earth today. Because fatherhood is a, is a construct from God. Uh, being a father is from God. And what's really amazing about uh, being shown kindness from your father is it makes you less scared to be one yourself. I think a lot of people are afraid of fatherhood because they had negative experiences from their fathers. And we become worldly and we forget that God was our father first. He always was and he always will be. And he's been a great father to all of us. And so we can have confidence. You know, uh, I, I personally plan on being a father within the next five years. That, that's my goal. And I, I understand there's some steps I got to take before I get there. But I'm excited to be a father because I want to give my kids the gift that my parents gave me. And that's a childhood that they won't have to recover from. And a big reason that I don't have to recover from my childhood and the big reason why I'm excited to give my kids that same gift is because they're going to grow up in the kingdom. They're going to grow up around the church. They're going to grow up with the, the positive influences and the convictions instilled in them. In Proverbs 22 verse 9, it says that if you set a child off on the right path while they are young, they will not stray away from it later. And another thing I really appreciate is that although I did grow up in the church, yes, I never felt like I was smothered by it. I was never just completely indoctrinated <laughs> with religion because I think that obviously that turns people off, you know, because then it's not a choice anymore. Although I was always given those good influences, I always had the freedom of choice. And my parents always told me, like, you don't have to come to church. You, you don't have to do any of this. You need to make your own decisions for your own life. And I plan on doing that with my children as well because I believe that if I set them on the path while they're young, they're not going to turn from it later. And so I want to encourage you guys today. Uh, if, you're, if you're a parent, you have kids and you're worried about them, just set them on the right path now. They're not going to turn away from it later. And pour your heart out into them. That's really what makes the difference. You know, we look at great men in the Bible like David, like, like, uh, who, who was the king of, of Israel. And we look at men like Eli, who was a high priest. And they're not known for being great fathers. And the reason why is because they didn't pour their hearts out into their children. Yes, they were great in their own realm, but they didn't pour it out into their kids. And that's the difference that fathers can make today. And so whether you, you fit more in the father profile or the son profile, or maybe both, remember that you have an important responsibility to fulfill that role, to be a father to the fatherless and to be incredible sons who are appreciative and pour back into the ones who poured into them. Welcome back, church. Um, I'm so proud of Jordan and the man that he's become. And uh, I'm super proud of all my kids. I'm proud of the church for uh, helping him become uh, the man that uh, he's become. I have a short lesson that I want to give you right now. It is called How to Break the Generational Curse. So please turn with me over to John chapter 1. Um, this is what I learned for myself to help me break the generational curse. I think there's a lot more Bible study needed. Uh, but uh, for now, we're going to look at a few scriptures and I hope it helps. In John chapter 1, uh, in verse 9, it says, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or husband's will, but born of God. And so you see the purpose 
for Jesus to come down here was to help break the generational curse so that we could be born of God and so the apple that falls far <laughs> doesn't fall far from the tree will be the very fruit of God, which is amazing. In Matthew chapter 16, he tells us how he's going to do it. Um, he has his disciples in a, in a circle. I picture them like at a campfire and he's talking to them about who people say he is. And then he asks his disciples, who do you think I am? And Peter says, you're the savior of the world. And so he responds in uh, verse 18, he says, I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And so Jesus's plan was to be the savior of the world, to bring a church and uh, through this church, he was able to uh, uh, save the world. And it says here that the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And so the darkness of the world is, is not going to be able to overcome the church that he builds. And he says, I'm gonna build it on a rock. And, and a rock represents stability. So many families out there are so unstable and uh, shaky. But when we build our families on the rock, we can be secure and feel at peace. And so that's amazing. So his plan was for the church. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul is teaching uh, young Timothy how to lead a church. And in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, he says this. Um, in verse 15, he says, You will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. And so the Bible says that um, in the church, we can learn how to live, how to conduct ourselves in God's house, in his family. And he says it's the church of the living God, his household. And it's where you find the truth, the pillar and the foundation of the truth. And so, you know, there's so many different teachings out there and uh, what we have in the church and the scriptures is that we can actually find the truth. Instead of going by people's opinions and their feelings, we can actually look in the scriptures and learn how we should conduct ourselves. In Galatians chapter 3, it says in verse 26, So in Christ, listen to this, this is amazing, listen to this. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Is that amazing? So to enter into this family, uh, to be a child of God, it's, it's through baptism. And then we're clothed with Christ. And so we're given the Holy Spirit. And in chapter five of the same book, Galatians chapter five in verse 22, it says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is now our new apple that falls from the tree of God. And so through the Spirit, we can learn how to have this kind of life full of love and joy and peace and all these amazing things that God gives us, along with an incredible family of brothers and sisters that are just as committed to living out this life uh, and so it's amazing to see that through the church, through Jesus coming down and starting the church, that uh, we have an opportunity to break the generational curse. That's what happened with me when I was invited to uh, come and study the Bible and to really learn what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Um, it changed my life. It, it taught me how to live, how to conduct myself, um, how to love God how to really love God and to love people and to love myself. You know, God says that we should love our neighbor as ourself. And so many people, they don't even love themselves. How can they love their neighbor? But God, through the church and through his word, teaches us how to love ourselves because he made us so amazing. And um, through the church, we, we learn how to have incredible marriages. You know, uh, this year and actually next week, uh, my wife and I will be celebrating our 25th year anniversary of being married. And uh, we've been faithful, and I've learned how to love her. We've learned how to raise children together. And it was in the church, uh, the way that God intended. And so for myself, 
Uh, I know that the church is where the healing began. In the church is uh, where I received the counseling and the training and just to learn to be able to let all that stuff go. The cycle of anger, the cycle of rage, the cycle of impurity, unfaithfulness, addiction, all those things I was able to break the generational curse through God's amazing plan and that worked for me and I know it can work for you as well. Um, at this time what I'd like to do is I would like to uh, give an altar call. And so, before I give my altar call, I want to express my concern with so-called altar calls. <clears throat> so, people around the United States and around the world are being misled by this teaching that if you say a prayer, if you repeat after me and say this prayer, you can be saved. It's called the sinner's prayer. And I can tell you, nowhere in the Bible will you find anyone who prayed Jesus into their heart. Nowhere in the Bible are you gonna find anyone who prayed the Holy Spirit into their life. It's not in the Bible, it doesn't exist, it's a false teaching and it's being propagated every Sunday. And it upsets me, it angers me, but most of all, it concerns me and it motivates me. And so my altar call is this. <clears throat> I'd like you to learn more about what the scriptures say. My altar call is click down below, click the link, and ask someone to study the Bible with you so you can learn the truth about how to break the generational curse, how to be right with God. Tell them you'd like to study the Bible. Tell them you want to get baptized into Christ. Or you can just call me directly. Uh, my phone number is 929-456-3729. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, we can study the Bible together. And uh, uh, it, it, I'll teach you what I learned. And you can see um, the life-changing power that helped me. I will gladly teach you because people are willing to get into my life and so for the rest of my life I dedicate myself to teach others and everyone I know in our church is dedicated to doing the same thing and so for those of you that are members of the church I want to challenge you guys get into the lives of those that God puts in your life and help them break the generational curse I'd like all of us today on Father's Day to be able to say a prayer tonight and just to be able to look up and say Happy Father's Day. I hope that you are proud of the decision that I made in honor of you. And to God be all the glory.